everybody, and welcome to Answers. I'm Dale, and I'm so glad that you have joined me today. Uh, Answers is a program where we look in the Word of God uh, for the answers to the various questions that we encounter day in and day out. Uh, sometimes it's things that people ask us about. Sometimes it's things that people wonder about. And I am convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt that the Lord has given us everything uh, that we need uh, to be vessels of His uh, presence and to be within the kingdom of God here in the kingdom of darkness upon the earth where we live. Because there is no doubt that the days are increasing in darkness, uh, that evil is increasing. Uh, this is nothing to be surprised about because the Lord Himself told us that these things would happen. And so what we've been looking at in, in the last two or three, maybe even four times together, is something that I want us to continue examining. We're sort of taking our time, and but it is a common theme. And it arises out of uh, two questions two questions that the disciples asked the Lord Jesus Christ one day. So let me remind you of the context here real quick. We'll be looking in Matthew 24 and reading a little bit about that, which we've done the last couple of weeks. And then we're going to pick up uh, a couple other passages as we go on uh, week by week. Uh, I sort of anticipated us uh, looking at one particular passage today. So here's what was going on. Uh, Jesus was in the temple teaching, and he had had a time just speaking forth the truth, and the scribes and the Pharisees were there. And in the 23rd chapter of uh, Matthew, it's repeated over and over, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. That's what Jesus was saying. And then he would tell them, this is what you're doing to the people. This is what you're doing to my people. And you should not be doing these things. And he went after one after another after another, several items, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. And then when he was walking out, his heart was just broken about the encounter he'd had. And he said, oh, what's well, at the end of the 23rd chapter? It says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you now desolate. For I say to you, from now on you shall not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there's varied degrees of fulfillment of that that occurred and have yet to occur. Quite often with prophetic words, uh, particularly in the Old Testament, you'll see that there was fulfillment that came about. In, in the near future, shall we say, and then something that came about down the road, sometimes something that has yet to come about. And so this is sort of an example of that. Immediately, we see the next chapter in our Bible, chapter 24 of Matthew, but there's no chapter in versification in the original documents. Well, Jesus came out of the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. I just love this because this is so much like us, what we would have done. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. They had come out and pointed out the buildings. Oh, Master, look at these things. Aren't these buildings great? This temple, this whole temple complex, this temple plant, Lord, this is a pretty good idea. Glad you came up with this. This looks great. This is looking. And they were so distracted by that. And I don't know what was going through their mind. I, I know perhaps what I would have done. Maybe they were trying to lighten the moment because it had been a pretty heavy thing that had been happening with Jesus in there. And, and they, perhaps they were sort of scared. Perhaps the scribes and Pharisees were still listening and following along. And they're saying, hey, we need to lighten this up a little bit. You know, look at these buildings, Master. Isn't this a great place? Jesus was having nothing to do with it. Listen to what he said. He said to them, don't you know that there will not be one stone left upon another which will not be torn down? Well, at that right there, the disciples began to realize, well, okay. So they just kept walking, walked down the Kidron Valley, came up to the Mount of Olives. And it says this very next verse. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. There were two or three of them, one of the other Gospels tells us. And they said this, here's the two questions they ask. Tell us, when will these things be? The things he had been talking about, when will they be? That is a question that comes about so, so often. People want to know several things. Quite often believers want to know, when is the Lord coming again? When will this be? And the Lord tells us a lot of information about it. And as a matter of fact, this passage right here, Matthew 24 and in 25, gives us so much detail about the coming of the Lord. And quite often when people teach on it, when they preach on it, when you read writings about it, uh, people may pull a verse here and there, but they really don't have a, an understanding of what Jesus was saying right here. And they don't use this as a major skeletal outline and framing of the understanding of the coming again of the Lord. So the disciples were saying the same thing. When will these things be? And then they ask this other question, which is a twofold question tied into the original question. 
and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They ask, when is it going to be and what's going to be the sign? The sign of your coming and the sign of the end of the age. And you say, well, is that the same sign or the two separate signs? <laughs> we'll get to that much later, okay? But just look at the questions. He says, when will these things be is what the disciples want to know. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The first thing that Jesus said is this. He answered them and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. Now, we talked some about that last week and examined some scripture about it. We're going to look at it again this week. See to it that no one misleads you. The first thing out of the mouth of the Most High God was, see to it that no one misleads you. Deception and the misleading of the body of Christ is rampant around the world. And a lot of times we'll say, oh yeah, we know this happens over here and over here, but we don't look where we are. Folks, we are in the midst of times where tremendous deception is arising. Let me read the next verse because Jesus gives us a little more insight into it. He says, for many will come in my name. He's telling them where the misleading will come from. Many will come in my name. You know, quite often we want to look at other religions and point and say, well, it's the Buddhist or it's the Hindu or it's this or that where the deception is coming about. Jesus is saying many will come in my name. So let's pay attention to that first before we get distracted by the other things. And here's what they'll be saying. This is the Lord speaking. I am the Christ and will mislead many. Now that can be interpreted in a couple of ways, both of which I think are accurate and correct. Okay, It says, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Now, a lot of people say, well, that means that people will come saying, hey, I am the Christ, I'm the anointed one, I am the Messiah, and will mislead people astray. Well, that's absolutely true. There's been many, many a person that has come and declared that they are the Christ. But notice this, for many will come in my name. Jesus is saying many will come in my name and say, I am the Christ and mislead many. So you've got two or three things happening here. You'll have people that will come saying, I am Messiah, I am the Christ, and they will mislead folks, but they don't really acknowledge that Jesus was Messiah. We have that happen. We know that deception occurs and that misleading. And we could sit here and go through various things, whether it's uh, uh, Jim Jones or David Koresh or the various folks that have been deceived in that way. I mean, in my lifetime, okay? So there's no doubt that occurs. But we also have this thing, but many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and mislead many. So there will be some that will say, oh, well, Jesus was Messiah too, but I am Messiah also. Okay? We are little messiahs. We are little Christ. Now, be careful here. I know what some people, I mean, you'll hear that um, in various forms in various places that people will say, well, you're a little Christ. You're a little God. I know what they mean by that. And a lot of times when I hear somebody say that, I just go, well, Lord, I, I know their heart, but they just, that's not the right way to say it, okay? Uh, we are so blessed if we're true believers because the Most High God through the Holy Spirit dwells within us. But that does not make us God. There's clear delineation there in terminology, okay? So what he's saying right here, many will come and say, in my name, saying in the name of Jesus, I am the Christ. You're looking at that's wrong. There's also this understanding right here that many will come, many will come, and they will say that Jesus is the Christ. Okay, in other words, they will acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, and yet they will mislead the many. See, so often we just believe, oh, this is just false prophets and false teachers that are saying they've got a messianic problem, right, a complex. They think that they're Messiah. True, that will happen. But there's also the thing that there will be many who will come that will say, oh, yeah, Jesus is Christ. Jesus is Messiah. Here's a big one. Oh, yeah, Jesus is a way. Jesus, yeah, he's, he's one of the ways to heaven. You will hear that so often. And what's referred to in a lot of major religions, and honestly, in a lot of what's referred to as mainstream Christian religions, people uh, over, mm, let's say the last 50, 100 years, more and more you're, you'll hear the thing that, oh, well, that Jesus is a way and the way for me. In other words, they're equivocating. They say, well, I'm not sure, but uh, that, that, he may not be the way for you, but he is for me. That is deception. That is misleading. And what Jesus is warning about is this, that many will come in my name, saying they're Christians, that we're believers, and will say, I am the Christ. They're acknowledging that Jesus is Christ, that he's Messiah, but they will mislead many. 
You know, that thought right there is probably enough for us just to dwell upon for the balance of the day and meditate upon that. But I want us to look at some other uh, scripture related to this. Now, what happens here in Matthew 24? It's the first, uh, uh, well, uh, verses 3 through 14. Jesus is answering these two questions. And he's doing it in a very uh, broad, panoramic type of way. He's saying, here's what's going to happen. And then he lays out some things. And, and I read it uh, a few weeks ago for us. And we're going to deal with each one of these things as we go along. That's where he says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and nations rise up against nation. And you're going to have great tribulation, okay? So he's doing these things blow by blow. And there's a big panorama. Then in verse 15, he says, "Is therefore, when you see a particular thing, and that particular thing is the abomination of desolation that was spoken of by Daniel. That's an intriguing phrase because Jesus is speaking it. So that means that Jesus believed that Daniel was a prophet. You see it right here. It says Daniel the prophet. And so what he does, he shows that he believes that the truth, the prophetic word of Daniel is this. What he does is he does this panoramic understanding. Then in verse 15 he says, when you see this particular thing that Daniel spoke of, then, watch this, and he starts doing more detail about what he had explained in verses 3 through 14. And when you start reading Matthew 24, you see, oh, okay, that's what's going on. The first part, he's telling us the whole story, and then he comes back and says, okay, now let's look at some details of this. The reason I'm explaining that is, in verse 4, he says, see to it that no one mislead you. Verse 5, for many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will mislead Many, okay, whether they're trying to say that they're Messiah or whether they're coming in the name of the Lord, saying they affirm the Lord Jesus Christ and yet deceived many. Because when he's going through, then in verse 12, Jesus says this. Uh, well, verse 11, and many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. You can see how that when there's false teaching, when you see how there's those who come to mislead, how this could occur. So Jesus is sitting there saying, see to it that no one misleads you. Now, we talked some about this previously. The primary way you can be certain to see to it that no one misleads you is that you are abiding in the Lord. Jesus tells us that in John 15. He says, abide with me, abide with me, abide with me. We abide with the Lord by remaining in his word. Okay, it is the sword is the reason it's referred to as a sword. Okay, it is the word of the most high God. <laughs> And he will train us and equip us and show us his truth. His Holy Spirit dwells within us. And with the Holy Spirit and his word, when deception comes our way, the Lord will warn us. We will see it. I saw it this week. Um, I, I will not go into details and names or anything. I just read an article today that's in a major uh, publication that's just been released, I believe, today. And this is the, uh, uh, the first of uh, 2011. And... Uh, it's about a pastor, and sometimes people say, oh, he fell, he fell. He didn't fall, he sinned, okay? I know what you mean. You fall when you're walking along, you trip over something you didn't, un, you didn't anticipate. It's like when you go to the Garden of Eden, people say, well, Adam and Eve fell. They did not fall, they rebelled. They rebelled, okay? Falling is an accident. Sin is purposeful. And so uh, this pastor, very, very nationally well-known, he fell, okay? He sinned. And so now he is uh, going about doing what he feels like he's supposed to do, and he's been interviewed by a major, major magazine. And it's the saddest thing because you can see where he will acknowledge that the sin in which he participated, the scripture says, you shouldn't do this. Okay? You should not do this. But he's coming back, and he's saying, but, and he tries to water away a little bit the word of God. People do that all the time. You know what's happening? He's misleading hundreds. He's misleading thousands uh, with the particular form that he's in right now. He'll mislead many. The Lord has told us to beware and see to it that you be not misled. If you know the Word of God, you know that sin is sin, and the particular sin of which he committed, he knows that it was a sin, and you will know that it's a sin. It doesn't mean that you hate the person, but you know it's a sin, and you'll be able to tell somebody, wait, that's a sin. Don't do it. Don't be misled. Uh, let me read another verse here. and We'll take a break. Okay. Uh, the verse previous to this is interesting. Jesus said this. At a particular time, at that time, we'll talk about that later, many will fall away and deliver up one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Now, I'm going to jump ahead. This is 12 verses later, when Jesus is talking about, therefore, when you see what happened to Daniel, watch out, certain things will occur. Jesus says this, 
Then, if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, and there he is, do not believe him. We'll go into more detail about this later. But when you see people saying, Oh, Messiah's over here, or Messiah's over here, don't believe it. Here's why. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. You talk about a loaded verse right there. I mean, that, that right there really destroys a lot of people's theology because they go, well, I didn't know about this, or I didn't know about this, or I didn't know about this. But Jesus tells us, let me read it again. For false Christ and false prophets will arise. He tells us they will. And will show great signs and wonders. People, I mean, they're going to be showing great signs and wonders that they will look like that they are true Christ. They will look like that they are true prophets. But Jesus says this, they're going to mislead to many. And they're going to be misleading to such a degree that he says it, they'll mislead, if possible, even the elect. We're going to look at another time dealing with end time kind of things, like when the Lord comes again. Some things that will happen and might even be possible with the elect if we're not standing firm. The very next verse, Matthew 24, 25, Jesus says this, Behold, I told you in advance. Behold, I told you in advance. He told his disciples these truths right here in relationship to a question they'd ask. When will these things be? And what's going to be the sign of your coming again and of the end of the age? They knew there was a greater picture involved with this. Jesus starts answering. The first, two, the first thing is, see to it that no one misleads you. And then he keeps reiterating it. You're going to have people that will come along and act like they're Christ. You're going to have people that will do this. False Christ, false prophets. And they're going to be showing signs and wonders. But then he says, behold, I have told you in advance. Folks, we have been warned in advance. I tell you what, uh, we're going to take a break right here. And then when we come back, we're going we're to go to, I believe, 2 Timothy is where we're going to go. So stay with me and I'll be right back. Welcome back to Answers. I just thank you so much uh, for examining the Word of God. You know, not a lot of people do this. We'll just take a few minutes to examine the Scripture and see what the Lord has to say. I believe people are doing it more and more as the days get darker, as they see things, as they understand, wait a minute, there's something wrong with things. And so we've seen what the Lord said. He said, I have told you in advance these things were going to happen, that there's going to be a misleading, that there will be false Christ and false prophets. Uh, I'm going to read a portion of Scripture. I really thought I'd be able to read the whole thing today, but I probably won't be able to. Yeah, but if the Lord tarries, we'll look at it next week, okay? So it's 2 Timothy chapter 3. And 2 Timothy was written by Paul, and he wrote it to his uh, protege, Timothy. And Paul's at the end of his life. And literally 2 Timothy is where Paul is uh, passing the baton to him and telling him some truths. And in the second chapter, he's sitting there telling himself, this is how the, the righteous man of God must live. This is how you must do some things. How the bondservant must be not quarrelsome. You must be loving, okay? You must correct gently. Okay? And he's talking about how Timothy would function uh, within the calling that the Lord had placed in his life. Then, chapter 3, verse 1, uh, one of the most powerful words in the Word of God. Are you ready? Here's what the word is. But. But. Okay? But realize this. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to and through Paul to Timothy, to us. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. See, Paul knew this. Paul knew by the Holy Spirit that things were going to happen. He didn't know when the last days was going to be. 
he thoroughly anticipated, and from some of his other writings you see this, uh, some of these things taking place in his time. And when you look at the things that were occurring in his time, you think, boy, that looks like horrific, horrible times. Well, folks, we're uh, 1,900 plus years past that. Mm -hmm. And he's telling us this, that difficult days will occur, difficult times. And then he says this, for men will be lovers of self. This is a long list right here. So just listen to this list if you're unable to follow along in the word. Lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents. I'm always intrigued by that little phrase because you see it here and you also see it over in the end of the first chapter of Romans where Paul is writing and he writes out this list of, of what the evil is. And they're not inclusive lists, they're just examples of things that will happen. And some of these things are just abhorrent. But then other ones you think, oh, that's just a trite little thing like, you know, being disobedient to parents. That's not really important. <laughs> it's very important. So again, lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips. <laughs> Is, is there a difference between a gossip and a malicious gossip? Well, yeah, we're not to gossip, but a malicious gossip with the intention of causing harm and hurt about somebody. Without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied his power, and avoid such men as these. Jesus told us, see to it that no one deceive you. See to it that no one mislead you. See to it that no one pull you down the wrong path in the wrong way. And right here, the Lord gives us characteristics of individual that function that way. The one that has struck me for the last probably 20 plus years is the last one I read right there that they hold to a form of godliness although they have denied his power see these type of people that we need to be careful they will not mislead us will have a form of godliness they will be religious probably very actively involved within a religious institution and they will hold to a form of godliness and yet they will deny the power thereof. We need to be very, very careful like that. If you find yourself in a situation where there's a form of godliness and people will, will teach a certain portion of the Word of God, but then they deny the power of the Lord, be very, very careful with that. Sometimes they're simply unlearned and they're ignorant. Sometimes they're adhering to the traditions of men and say, well, God doesn't do that today. He used to, but do that. If you hear somebody saying, God does not, be real careful. Okay? Depends on what follows, okay? Hear me carefully. Depends on what follows. But just listen to what's being said. And then he gives some examples of this. Verse 6. For among them are those who enter in a household and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth Men of depraved mind rejected as regards the faith. See, they oppose the truth. They have a depraved mind. They've been rejected when it comes to the true faith, but they have a form of godliness. Now, some of them are very, very easy to, to point out. Sometimes somebody will have a form of godliness within an environmental movement, for instance. And you say, oh, well, that's not really worshiping God or anything. Hey, look at some of the environmental movement, and you find out that that is their religion. Oh, they worship Mother Gaia, Mother Earth, the Mother Nature kind of thing. Those are easy to point out. When you see somebody that adheres to a form of godliness, and they happen to be in a key leadership position within uh, the professing body of Christ, that's what's being warned of here. I continue, verse 9. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all as also that of the two that opposed Moses were. But you, this is Paul telling Timothy what, what to do, and this is the word I want to leave with this. But you, follow my teaching. You know, we really need to do that more. We, sometimes we think that's arrogant. <laughs> what do you mean, telling somebody to follow your teaching? Yes, if your teaching comes from the Word of God. I'm telling you right now, follow my teaching because I'm reading it straight out of the Word, okay? Follow my teaching, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, and my perseverance. 
persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. This is Paul encouraging Timothy. And indeed, here's a promise. Are you ready for this promise? I've got a promise for you today. And indeed, all who desire to be godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you desire to be godly in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. But, another but, evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse and deceiving and being deceived. Jesus tells us this truth. Paul tells us this truth through the Holy Spirit. Peter tells us this truth. We'll look at that another time. But he says that evil will continue from deception to deception. Listen to these last four verses. We are going to be able to finish it and then we'll be done, okay? You, however, continue in the things which you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which have been able to give you the wisdom which leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Paul is reminding Timothy, you've known the scriptures. And what he's speaking of that time is the Old Testament. He said, you've known them from childhood. And that is what leads you to salvation and faith through Christ Jesus. Now, I stop there because I want you to see that. And these last two verses, I suspect, are very, very um, well known by all of us. But you see the context now. And the context, context is a warning to not be misled, a warning to realize that there will be people within the body of Christ that will seek to harm the body of Christ. Here's the next verse. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You want to know how to make sure that you will not be misled? Jesus said, see to it that you be not misled. Very forth, a directive like that. He says, see to it. If we know the Word of God, if we will take the Word of God and realize it is an inspired Word that is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, then we will know that with the Word and with the power of the Spirit guiding us and guarding us, we will not be misled. We have nothing to fear about. We will not be misled. If we do not do that, then we will be susceptible, susceptible to the misleading lies of the evil one. Let me pray for us real quick. Lord, I thank you for your word, for your truth, and for how you've promised to protect us and watch over us, Lord. And we just thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I thank you so much for being with me on Answers. And so I encourage you to tell everybody about it and come back again next time. And I'll see you then. Goodbye.